you get this question of like, are comics dying? I don't think so at all. Comics are changing. I spoke to a publisher literally today who told me that they make more money through crowdfunding than going to the direct market. Comics might not be dying, but I think that the direct market might be in a little bit of trouble. This is what selling comics is now. It's no longer the way I want it to be of just people coming into the store. Hey guys, before we get into the show, we need to take a quick moment to shout out our sponsors. First up, Ultra Pro. Ultra Pro has the best protective materials for your card, gaming, or even comic book collecting needs. Here in their shop, they have all sorts of goodies like top loaders, bags and boards, and even UV protected holders. And the best part is if you head over to their online store, ultrapro.com, and use my promo code SWAGGLE, which you'll see in the description, you'll be able to save 5% off on your next order. Again, that is ultrapro.com. Use promo code SWAGGLE to save 5%. This episode of Swagglecast is also sponsored by me. The Pulp Adventure continues with issues two and three of my comic series, Sanity, a noir detective story set in the Lovecraftian universe. The Kickstarter is now live and has already been successfully funded. So go check out the project and see if it's something that you want to consider backing today. Link in the description. And if you would like to get caught up on the journey, you can also pick up issue one at swagglehosscomics.com. That is swagglehosscomics.com. Thank you all so much for watching and for your continued support of the channel. Now, with all the sponsors out of the way, let us get on with the show. All right. Well, here I am with Jordan Plosky from Zoop Comics. Zoop is a crowdfunding platform. You are the founder of the CEO. It's great to talk to you, uh, Jordan, today. Thanks so much for hopping on the channel. Yeah. Mickey, I appreciate you having me on, man. Always good to talk to you. Yeah, yeah. It's always good seeing you, uh, you know, uh, on the con floors. You know, we bumped into each other a couple of times and had different kind of, kind of conversations. I think you were recently at WonderCon, um, if I'm not mistaken. How, how was that experience for you? I was, uh, it was interesting this year. I'm not going to lie. It, it felt, um, I don't, I, I've seen some of the, the other online discourse. It seemed like not everybody was really stoked on the show this year. And I, and I think I kind of walked away feeling almost the same way. Yeah. Yeah. It was an interesting vibe. Like I definitely kind of felt the attendance was a little bit thin and maybe you want to chalk it up to Easter. Maybe you want to chalk it up to, it was raining in Southern California, which rain in Southern California is like a snow day in like the East coast, you know? So I wasn't overly concerned about the attendance, it, but it was really, I mean, nothing against the guests who were there, but it, it didn't really strike me as like that powerful sort of guest list in the, in the comics world. And I'm not necessarily one that goes for the media side of things, but even I heard people saying like, hey, there was really nothing spectacular. And I feel terrible. I don't, I don't hate saying anything bad about anybody. I know how hard it is like to put on a show in general, but it felt underwhelming compared to years past for sure. Yeah, that's a good point. It, it, it did sort of feel like there wasn't um, maybe as many marquee kind of talents yeah. that were at previous events. And obviously, those are the things that bring people in as far as like, you know, the meet and greets and getting autographs and stuff. So, um, yeah, it, I always wonder with WonderCon if if they kind of compete with each other because it's the same organization that puts on San Diego Comic Con. And so are they like trying to figure out, oh, well, if we book talent here, actually, maybe we want to bring, bring them to San Diego instead. And I want it must be a tough thing. It's a good question, but I feel if they're spaced out enough that people can go to both and still feel like they're getting their fix, you know, like it, we're fans, man. Like you go yeah. to multiple shows. Like I go to multiple shows. Maybe it's more on the business side, but like I go to even the little shows in LA. Like I'm I live in LA. So, you know, when there's like little comic shows, I'll go to those sometimes too. It's not I yeah, I don't think it's really like a conflict. It 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 just seemed to be something off this year and i hope that it doesn't carry over into san diego to, to your point i hope that san diego is still like the big blowout you know big spectacle of the year yeah yeah well we'll, we'll definitely have to see what comes of it you know later on but uh you know I'm, I'm glad you were able to take the time you know on this channel here because uh you have zoop you know we're going to dive all into the crowdfunding comic book space um, but you know, before we get into those nitty gritty topics, I mean, maybe you can give everybody in case they don't know you and Zoop, just a quick little overview of like what the company is, uh, sure. just kind of caught up to speed. Yeah. So most people, when they think of, of crowdfunding, they think of Kickstarter, right? They kind of have that like band-aid Kleenex effect. People will say, I'm doing a Kickstarter, even if they're on Zoop, we still get that. So it, it's up to us to try to, you know, change people's vernacular when it comes to this. But the big differentiator for Zoop uh, versus Kickstarter or Indiegogo is that we're a full service platform. So we kind of start from the preface, from like the thought, the idea that um, crowdfunding is hard. If you're a creator, 
and you want to write a book or you want to draw a book, the last thing you want to do is have to figure out how you're going to package that book, how you're going to send out hundreds of packages to those backers. And quite frankly, you might not even want to have to figure out the technology and the platform and, and do all the budgeting and, and all the financials in order to have a, a successful campaign. And one other thing that we see is a lot of creators don't necessarily want to be salesmen either. Um, and realistically, when you go, when you use a uh, Kickstarter or Indiegogo, you have to be all of those things as a creator. You're not just the writer. You're not just the artist. You are now your, you know, CFO. You are now your chief marketing person. You're handling logistics. You have to figure out where you're printing this thing. So the fact that Zoop comes in and takes all of that off of a creator's plate is a big value add to those creators. It frees them up. Um, essentially to keep doing maybe if they have other freelance work or their day job, this isn't something that piles on on top of that. We literally save months of time because we have our vendors in place. Um, so instead of, you know, a creator having to do that research and having to vet vendors and negotiate with vendors and get quotes and, and all the back and forth, it's all just under one roof, one call or one email. And we take care of all of that on top of funding, uh, you know, the project as well. So you have support, you have a team behind you as opposed to just going it alone and hoping that people find it on Kickstarter. Yeah, it's definitely something that I, I can attest to as far as like, you know, having done my own kind of crowdfunded book and had the experience. Um, I would say, I think it's fair to say that 90% of my time is spent more on logistics, fulfillment, uh, you know, being the, you know, uh, uh, sort of producer of the comic and sure. all that stuff, at, at least in terms of, let's say the, the kick, the Kickstarter portion or the crowdfund portion or whatever platform you would be on like that, that side of it. And very, very, um, a small amount of my time is, is spent on the kind of creative aspect, Yeah, uh, which I think for, you know, speaking for a, a lot of artists and, and writers and what I assume their personalities are like, you know, I think most artists are more interested in being creative. And like you said, not being as interested in being a salesman. So uh, it, it does really feel like, you know, when, when you've initially told me about Zoop and like what it was and, and what you guys sort of offer, it was very, very clear uh, what the kind of advantage was um, with this crowdfunding, crowdfunding platform versus a, you know, the, the big two, which I would call like Kickstarter and Indiegogo uh, in the space. Yeah, you know, and, and one of the criticisms, or I shouldn't even say criticisms because it's a fair thing, is, you know, well, the audience is over on Kickstarter. Sure, mm -hmm. that's that's true. And, you know, Mickey, I don't know what your analytics tell you of how many new backers you get from Kickstarter. We we typically hear it's in that 15 to 20% range, right, of, of mm -hmm. discoverability. You know, you, if you bring 100 of your backers, maybe you'll get another 15 to 20 backers, like, from Kickstarter. But realistically we also bring that 15 to 20 percent the mm. difference the difference being you know kickstarter is not there to support you it just happens right so they passively bring you those additional backers we are out there doing email marketing social media marketing helping get you know get our creators on podcasts on youtube shows doing press releases so we're we're also getting that 15 to 20 percent we're just more aggressive about it because we are you know the the contender in the space i, I like to say creators coming to Zoop, you'll be a bigger fish in a smaller pond. But realistically, wherever a creator goes to crowdfund, their crowd is going to come and support them wherever they are. Right, right. Well, I want to table that point about like having the crowd and and bringing that, you know, to, you know, you, you creating comic books and stuff, because I, I think that that's a very interesting point. But before I quite get there, sure, I just wanted to talk a little bit about get your thoughts on crowdfunding as a space. Sure. For me, Maybe it's because I'm I pay more attention to it now because I've I've been through it. But I would say in the last couple of years, it feels like it's really exploded to the point where you now even see some of the big publishers like a Dynamite Entertainment. I know they do like crowdfunding for some of their their covers. We had Berserker, you know, with Boom and Keanu Reeves sure. did something. You had uh, Whatnot Publishing with Wesley Snipes did did a crowdfund before that's, they released you know his right, book. Yeah. So. You're seeing these big publishers kind of enter the space and, yeah. um, you know, shout out to Dinesh, like a bad idea. Like, he, you know, he, they do all their books with that. And what I see as a valuable avenue for what crowdfunding can be is like, sure, there's the monetary aspect. It helps like alleviate some of the, the costs and you kind of get this nice pre-order. But really it becomes like kind of a tentpole 
marketing thing for your comic book, which to me is like maybe one of the biggest pain points in all of comics right now is like, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of stuff out there. And it's like new books hit the shelf. And it's like, as someone who's has a YouTube channel is knee deep in comic books, even for me, I don't know 80% of like the new comics that come out because there's just no marking there. I, I, I threw out, I threw out a lot to you to, to run with, it, but well, what do you just think about like crowdfunding space in general, where it's going? And obviously you started your company in the last few years. So you, I assume that you have to think that there's something here, but what do you, what is, what have been uh, the trends that you sort of seen in the last few years with it? Well, we definitely see it as an opportunity, right? Um, when the pandemic happened, a lot of things changed. Um, at the, at that time, Diamond still had their monopoly on distribution. Um, they had to shut down, no fault of their own. I mean, this was government restrictions. They had to shut down. Retailers all had to shut down. So this was like two or three months of, you know, no new content and, you know, potentially no paychecks for creators. Um, and at the same time, I think it was AT&T that just bought uh, Warner Brothers and they had slashed DC's output by 25%, if I remember correctly. So all this meant that there was fewer opportunities for creators. Um, but then on, on the flip side of all that, you know, because of the pandemic, we saw e-commerce explode in growth, you know, like 10 years in, in two months. And crowdfunding was sort of a part of that. And we saw that as an opportunity. It's like, oh, this is 100% a growth market. Um, mm -hmm. And with the way that people, you know, again, I mean, I really think that the pandemic changed a lot and accelerated uh, a lot of growth in, in tech. And I'm going to say the word convenience. Um, you know, I, I have an Instacart account. You know, I get groceries delivered to my home now. I, anything I want is sort of available at my fingertips. And comics as an industry, as much as I love comics and I'm like a lifelong fan, has just been notorious to be last adapters to new technology and like new innovations. So I'm not saying anything controversial, but judging no, by, yeah. I think um, that's so true. You know, and you, you get this question of like, are comics dying, right? And no, I, I don't think so at all. Comics are changing. Um, I, I spoke to a publisher literally today who told me that they make more money through crowdfunding than going to the direct market. Wow. I can't tell you who that is, obviously, but that's this is a legitimate publisher that's been around for at least, you know, off the top of my head, at least 10 or 15 years. Now, when you hear a publisher say that, that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with comics. They're happy. They're making money. They have their fans that are coming and they're buying. You know, I, I think comics might not be dying, but I think that the direct market might be in a little bit of trouble. Um, you know, th there's plenty of stores that are doing great because they've adapted, because they have events, because they've, you know, brought in uh, Funko Pops and and games and, and cards and, and plushies and other things. Um, they've adapted to social media presence and, and maybe they're doing live sales on, on Facebook or Instagram. Like they, they've, they've, they've made the efforts to realize like, Oh, this is what selling comics is now. It's no longer the way I want it to be um, of just people coming into the store. So you do have those people who are adapting and they're doing just fine. Um, I do think it's interesting. Now you have, you know, all these distributors um, to your point, yeah, there is a ton of new content coming out and it, it's hard to keep up with it. And as a fan, look, man, I mean, you know, the $4 price point for a single issue comic is is high, you know, yeah. which is funny hearing me say it because, you know, you can't get a $4 comic on, on a crowdfunding platform, right? Like a single yeah. issue is going to be like at least eight or 10 bucks, you know, and, and more often than not, you're looking at, you know, full, at least... 64 page graphic novellas, full graphic novels, hardcovers, things like that. But people are okay with that. People are okay with like, hey, I'm going to support this project. I want to support this creator. And bringing it back to your other question about publishers utilizing crowdfunding, man, I, you know, I understand that there are certain creators that are like not cool with that. But in my opinion, I, I really think that a rising tide floats all boats. I think that when you have a Boom Studios come, uh, you know, with Keanu Reeves and bring an additional 14,000 backers to the comics category of crowdfunding who maybe weren't there before, I don't see how that hurts anybody else. Um, you know, were those people going to come and, and, and buy 
you know, a comic from someone that they'd never heard of before, you know, the odds are not very high in that regard. But now that those people are on the platform, maybe they become part of that 15 to 20 percent that we talked about before that like, oh, I'm here now. I'll, I'll check out whatever else is here. That art looks cool. Or, you know, maybe you actually sell to those people who are now on the platform. So in my opinion, and you take a look at Zoop, we target some of these higher um, higher level, uh, that's the wrong terminology, um, more notable or like more well-known creators because sure. they drive, they drive traffic, you know, because it makes sense for us to provide our full suite of services to, to creators that we know are going to make a, a significant amount of money on the platform. But no one, I, you know, we didn't catch any flack because Howard Chaikin decided to go crowdfund something like, so I, you know, I, I, we've worked with a blaze. We actually, Mickey, you might you might appreciate this. Right now, there's only a couple of days left, and maybe by the time this airs, it might be over. But we're working with Vault Comics um, on something that we're calling a crowd building campaign. So they're not here necessarily to make money. Uh, what they're doing though is building a community around Barbaric. Their title uh, from Michael Marici. Uh, man, I, I want to say Nate Gooden is the artist as well. Um, but they're giving away. A free PDF. All you have to do is sign up, give your email address. You get a free comic to check out. Now, if you want, there are other things that you can go and purchase, you know, and that's cool too. But the more people that uh, that come in and back the campaign, and when I say back, I mean, just get your free comic. There's more free perks that get opened up so that everybody gets more free stuff. So once you cross 100 backers, 200 backers, 300 backers, now, instead of just getting the free PDF, you get a whole bunch of free stuff. And to me, I think that's a brilliant use of the platform, right? If you're a publisher and you're looking at this strictly as like a marketing tool, that's great. You, you you had a good give and take with your community, right? You're giving something, you're getting that that customer data, that information. And I don't see anything wrong with that because yeah, if people are into comics, why would you not want like, you know, publishers who theoretically have like, you know, a, a good quality of product. Why would you not want that? you know, readily available everywhere. Yeah. You know, it's, it is very interesting. And, and yeah, I'll go back to like the sort of ten pole marketing thing, like having a campaign sort of feel like a lightning rod, both from like attention to the book, but then also if I'm a consumer or backer or purchaser, like for me, I feel like, you know, this is, this is something that I get to be a part of it too. Like this is the little community that I kind of have with it. And I, I feel like more invested. And this was something that was very hard for me to imagine myself as I fulfill to other people. Like, you know, cause when I do it, it's like, well, why does anyone want to buy my book? But like, when I buy other people's book, I'm like, oh, this is awesome. Like I'm, I'm, I'm on their train. This is cool. You know, I'm happy for them. So I, I do think that there is something to that experience that, makes the crowdfunding space really nice. And, and, it, and I think that maybe the, the publishers, like you said, Vault and stuff are starting to sort of see the potential here. I am curious to, to kind of go back to one of the things that you said about the creators, maybe feeling, I don't know, is it apprehensive? I mean, I'm sure you go, you go to all the, the cons and stuff and I'm, you're talking to them and I'm sure you're getting the word out about the platform. Like, what do you, what do you feel creators feel about crowdfunding in general? Do, are, are there some of them that still kind of maybe have the fantasy of like, oh, I want to get hired by Marvel and I want to have like, you know, beyond Spider-Man and my book hit the shelf every Wednesday. And, you know, is there something that they they, they don't like this idea or are people like open to this idea? What's um, your yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's a little bit of everything. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and it's almost like that that image model. And what I mean by that is like you try to get that Marvel work so that then you can go turn around and do your creator own book at image. Yeah, and sure. now, and now maybe it's more like, Oh, try to go get that Marvel work so you can go turn around and do a crowdfunding campaign because mm -hmm. then you're just in control of your own destiny. Um, the thing about going to a publisher, right. Is like, now you have to pitch publishers. Now you have to potentially tweak your story. You have to get on their slate, um, you know, and you still have to do the marketing on your own. Um, and you're potentially giving up a piece of equity or ownership in your property. So with crowdfunding, it's truly self-publishing. Um, and you get to put out the story that you want on your time, uh, on your schedule, you know, and you get, you get to maintain a hundred percent ownership. So I think, 
I, look, I could be wrong, but I think that crowdfunding is universally accepted by creators. That being said, that doesn't mean that all of them want to take the plunge because of the amount of hard work that it actually is. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 and like you said, I mean, fulfillment aside, that marketing aspect and being the face. Yeah. You know, not everyone wants to be Stanley. You know what I mean? And like, totally. And if, if, if anything, I feel like maybe most comic creators would rather be in the dark room, like, you know, just drawing and stuff. I mean, that's my, that's my stereotype of, you know, artists and stuff, but. Understood. But I think to like sort of answer the question, I think the stigma of turning to crowdfunding is if it's not all the way gone, it's like 99% gone, you know, creators know the concept of it, I think have embraced the concept of it. It's just getting out of the basement, (laughs) you know, like to, to use that analogy and short, short story, you know, before my time in comics, I was a professional musician. I did fairly well for myself. I built up a nice resume and I'd have other musicians say to me, how did you get all of those gigs? And the reason I bring this up is because there is a very distinct parallel between being a freelance musician and a freelance comic book creator. And my answer was always, I was never the best, but I was always, I always put myself out there. I was always in the right place. I was always networking. I was always doing what I needed to do so that anytime someone needed a drummer, I was the last drummer that they saw. So that if they, you know, someone came up to them saying like, hey man, we need, you know, we need someone for this gig. Who do you know? And if I was the last guy they saw, I'm the first person that they're going to tell. It's the same thing with creating comics. You could have an Alan Moore epic that you're sitting on, but if you don't get out of that dark room or that dark basement and tell people about it, that's that's really half the battle. You know, you do have to create something worthwhile that other people want, but you also have to be able to let them know about it. So again, that's one of the places that crowdfunding in general and Zoop, you know, helps with too. Yeah. Let me ask this question, which is a leaded question to kind of what you are just sort of put out there. But what would you say makes a successful campaign? Why Uh, are some going to be like more bit like more massive than others, you know, and and what are some of the best practices and stuff uh, with that? Yeah. So it, it goes right to what we were just talking about. I think that a lot of people don't necessarily realize that the majority of the work is going to happen before you launch your campaign. Mm. You, the best thing that you can do is cultivate an audience ahead of a campaign. The best way to do that is to build an email list. Because as we all know, social media changes all the time. You might not have control over who's seeing your tweets or your Instagram posts or, you know, Facebook messages, whatever. But the thing that you can control is email. How do you build an email list? You know, th- there's a couple of different ways. You could start a newsletter. You can start a Substack. You could start a Patreon. You could start giving out free digital content in exchange for people signing up for an email list, but that is really your number one tool in the world of crowdfunding is email. Now, another extreme of that, and Mickey, I I don't know how long you've been doing your, your, your YouTube channel, but this is an excellent example of building a base and then having that crowd to tap into, um, for a crowdfunding campaign. We, we did, um, a campaign called binary C. This is a YouTuber called captain midnight. And he he had never put out a comic book before. You know, he he has no track record in the comics world, but he was a YouTuber. He reviews comics, pop culture, and he has a base of tens or hundreds of thousands of subscribers. And his campaign crushed, you know, because he had cultivated that audience ahead of time. The, you know, yes, build up your social media presence, you know, get get out of the house, you know, act, communicate, back other people's campaigns, start, you know, making uh, connections. I I don't want to say friends, but it's like, let people know that you exist. Um, Try to cut through the noise that's out there. And, you know, even if it's just like process artwork, pieces of images, like something. And if you're a writer, you know, just like get those thoughts out there for people to see. Um, You know, we did a campaign with Nick Pitara uh, called Axe Wielder John. And he teased that campaign for about five or six months you know we had a pre-launch page up for that long but what it did was it just built and built and built anticipation and 
got people continuing to sign up and sign up and sign up. And as soon as we launched, I mean, it was already a success. So there's tools, there's tricks. Um, you know, there's no like one kill shot. Otherwise, everybody would be doing it, you know, yeah. like, but th there's definitely ways to promote yourself. Um, that's probably the biggest thing that you can do before you launch a campaign. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's definitely interesting. And and I'm, uh, I'm very well aware that the reason I've been able to have a successful one is frankly, from my YouTube channel, you know, outside my YouTube, here, I'm, I'm in LA, I work in film, I do a lot of writing, I write in animations and video games and things like that. But nobody knows that, you know, sure. nobody knows who I am. This is my fir first foray into comic books. And they just know me as a guy who talks about, you know, vintage values and things like that. So, <laughs> so I know that, you know, the work of the comic or the creative, even though I believe in it and I, you know, I stand by that, I think the work is good. Nobody else knows that. The, the The only way to get people's attention is that like, okay, there was some audience that, you know, believed in me in some manner and they were willing to roll the dice and take a chance on me. And, and that, everything you say about that is, that seems clear to me that that's the most important part of having a successful campaign. And then all the other, you know, you know, intricacies of, of images and, and layouts and all that stuff come, come after. Um, but it really is, it really is a, a, a marketing thing. And um, it's a, it's a, it's a funny space that so you mentioned Captain Midnight and I'm well aware of his YouTube channel. He talks a lot about film stuff. He's got a great YouTube channel and kind of leads into maybe another avenue that I'm curious to hear your thoughts on both from uh, a, let's call it comic reader base. And also maybe from like a industry creator pro base there's a lot of we'll call them like influencer comic books that are starting to enter sort of the space some might consider what i've what i'm doing an influencer comic book you know captain midnight you know in in a way is a influencer comic book if you want it's branded in a bad way but you know for the sake of the conversation sure he's in there you have other creators on youtube you have other creators on instagram you know you've had like Eric July and Isom and, and, you know, these types of people that, that have come into the space. What's been your thought of like influencer comic books and where is influencer and having an audience? Like where's the cross section there? And like, do, do you feel like there, I, I get that there's some allergy to some <laughs> of the creators that are influencers who are making comic books. Do you ever get that sense from people in the industry or other say uh, we'll call them like, writers and artists that are working do they have kind of a um an envy in a way that that other creators can build up such a big campaign so fast man i i think you know guys like you captain midnight like it, it's authentic it's genuine you guys have like a clear love you know for the medium so mm -hmm. i think it makes sense for you to like try your hand at writing a comic and and like you know, hope that the community that that you've built up turns out for you. And, you know, you took a shot and 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 it worked, you know, I, I don't see a problem with that. I don't see a problem, you know, with Captain Midnight running a campaign because that audience wants to support, you know, it, it goes back to what you said before. It's like, yeah, they want to be a part of your success. You know, mm -hmm. it is that marketing tool, but it, it, it is also like, hey, I helped make that happen. Um, can I give a blanket statement for every influencer, you know, like, no, like Kylie Jenner probably shouldn't be doing a comic book or, or, you know, something like that. But if it makes sense, like, dude, take a look. I mean, you know, if we're talking about like 25 years ago, would we've been calling Kevin Smith an influencer when he, you know, wrote daredevil and green arrow and maybe my timeline is off, but you get the point it's, you know, or, um, you know, Patton Oswalt is putting out comic books right now, Gerard Way. Like, so, like, where does that line get blurred? These are people who are clearly passionate about comics and they just found success somewhere else, but like always wanted to be that comic writer or that comic artist, you know, like Danny Earls, right? Wasn't he like a professional soccer player before he, you know, started doing like covers for DC and, and Marvel? It's like, you know, he's one of us. Like, who cares? Yeah, like, who cares what the career was ahead of time, I guess? It's like some people have the benefit of, you know, having a head start for sure. Um, but in terms of like other creators, like, you know, 
thinking that that affects them somehow. It's just like run your race, you know, mm -hmm. you figure out what works for you. Actually, take a look at what those guys are doing maybe and, and see like how you can incorporate some of what they've done to help boost your own campaign. I think like, you know, like when I say run your own race, it's like I could spend all day looking at every single Kickstarter and analyzing, you know, what Kickstarter is doing better than us. But that's honestly not going to help me run my own company. Right. And if another creator is out there and they're doing some some big numbers somehow, check out and see what they're doing right. You know, and if it is that they somehow built up a fan base ahead of their their campaign, you know, and even if that happened to be in a different medium or in a different industry. Once again, they're bringing more people to comics. I, I see no problem with it. I, that That's a personal, you know, viewpoint. I, yeah, it, it's hard. It's hard to, you know, say like, and really just going back to the Kevin Smith thing. If he didn't come in and start writing Daredevil, like he, and maybe I'm overstating, but is he not like credited with basically saving Marvel at that time? Like, yeah, you know, so I, I don't know. I, yeah. It, it's an interesting, it's an interesting space. And you're right. Like, like who is an influencer? Is Wesley Snipes an influencer? Is Keanu Reeves an influencer? You know, but it's, I, don't know. I mean, I mean, in a way, but, but it's, it's a funny thing. Um, and, and, and I, and I, you know, I'm bringing this up with you because I, I think it's, it sort of becomes clear that, you know, in the crowdfunding world of comic books, like ha having that audience is huge. And, and yeah, yeah, if you can attach Keanu Reeves, you know, to your comic book, I mean, well, yeah, like, that, why would you not right like yeah. would, would anybody who's listening or you know seeing that if keanu reeves wanted you to write or draw his comic you're not gonna be like <laughs> no you're right. bad for the industry like you everybody would jump at that and then the thing is like when you have someone like a boom doing those campaigns that means that they're financially viable to continue putting out books like something is killing the children or house of slaughter or uh you know any number of other books that they're putting out like dynamite doing what do they do? Like eight hundred or nine hundred thousand on gargoyles? <laughs> like this, they did some crazy number. But like, what that also means is they get to keep putting out other content too. And I think that people maybe kind of don't see the forest through the trees when it comes to that. But like, if crowdfunding in general is helping these companies like stay afloat and you know continue employing people, continue employing creators, I, I see nothing wrong with any of it. That's again my my personal. Yeah. No, it makes sense. What do you think the relationship between like crowdfunding, maybe what you guys do as far as like kind of giving the white glove service to people who mm -hmm. in terms of fulfillment, some marketing, obviously you need their audience, but you guys are going to help. Yes. What's the relationship between what you guys do and the publisher model, you know, as far as like, in a, in a way, you guys aren't publishers, but you're doing a lot of that lifting for what publishers do do. You know, Correct. we talked about like what, uh, you know, every creator wants to have their own image book and kind of create their own IP. And and then, you know, I get to write and you guys get to fulfill and blah, blah, blah. But then it's like, okay, well, maybe Zoop's the publisher. I mean, I guess I ask you, I know you're yeah. not, but, but where right. do you sort of see this relationship going? We, we do refer to ourselves as a pseudo publisher because we do provide a lot of the services that a publisher does provide. Uh, one of those areas that we don't provide is editorial, right? So we're not in on the creative side of things. We don't dictate how the story goes. And the other thing we don't do is we don't provide an advance, but that's again, what the crowdfunding is for. Um, that being said, we've seen projects from Zoop go to publishers after a successful campaign. So I think that crowdfunding is a place that publishers are looking in order to bring content on board. And what entices them is getting completely finished stories, right? So if you have a graphic novel that can be broken up into four or five issues, for example, that publisher could then take those four or five issues, re-release them, re-release the, the trade, re-release the hardcover, and they don't have to pay any upfront because essentially the book is already complete. So there's a lot of incentive for those publishers to come and see like, oh, few hundred people back this that means that this creator has a fan base that they'll come back out maybe for you know the next round of this and we don't have to lay out you know twelve thousand bucks a single issue you know ahead of time and take a gamble on it so i think it de-risks it for publishers um we're having conversations with publishers as well seeing how we could sort of be that pipeline 
because for exactly those reasons, you know, like, oh, you mean we get fully completed stories and, and you know, issues from high level creators that we could then go turn around and, and make money off of this? Like, it, it just makes a lot of sense to combine crowdfunding with the publishing. Yeah. I mean, th that right there, actually, you know, as you say it, I mean, that has been the indie film studio model for, you know, the last 20 years, you know, where someone will be able to raise money, you know, make a festival darling, get it, get it funded, put it out. And then a universal or a legendary or whatever big distribution film company will come in and, and buy it at Sundance. And then that becomes, you know, their way to put it out in theater. So you guys are kind of fulfilling that, that indie film festival slash, you know, indie pr producer stuff. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, no, no, you know, you know, it, it, it happens. It hasn't happened that frequently. I mean, sure. we, we had Faceless in the Family from Matt Lesniewski, uh wound up at Oni Press. One of our first books, uh, Scarlet Couture, I believe was like at Titan. Maybe Des, the artist, got the, the rights back, did a, a crowdfunding campaign with us, and now Titan's putting it back out. Um, I know Nick Pitar has been having conversations. I don't know where he's at um, in terms of a deal, but I know that there's going to be more coming, you know, from Axe Wielder John as well. Um, and there's, there's other ones that, that are, you know, in conversations for re-releases. And actually one of our campaigns um, got contacted by a French publisher saying that they want to, you know, want the French rights and to put out the book, you know, over in France, which is amazing, right? And that wouldn't have happened without crowdfunding. So not only is that creator now getting, you know, uh, essentially a second bite at the apple, through crowdfunding and now they're going to get a third bite at the apple because someone's you know a publisher saw this through crowdfunding and wants to you know continue releasing uh the property so it, yeah I, I think that it's not one or the other mm. i think that if you're savvy enough and if you have that like grind to you know get it done through crowdfunding that you can find a home with a publisher as well the model doesn't really work the other way around i don't think you could really go to a publisher uh, you know you'd have to wait like 10 or 15 years to get your rights back to then crowdfund it but like yeah i mean i think that if you were to crowdfund something show success show that like hey i'm a viable creator in the market i have a finished product let's go take it you know to direct i'll i'll help market it i'll help you know promote on my socials and do whatever you know interviews then i think that like yeah you could get a couple of bites at the apple originating from crowdfunding mm -hmm. I want to switch gears a little bit to some of the other platforms. We don't have to get too into the weeds with this one. Um, but there's been a lot of, uh, what, do, what do you want to say? Like kind of a, a political conversations in comics between, you know, uh, certain creators and certain platforms have been like branded as, oh, this is, this is the platform for this. This is the platform for that. I'm curious with you, you know, as you guys kind of have it, 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 you know, have more hands on to some of the projects and stuff. Are you guys at all like curating the projects that you take on? Is it still truly like anyone can be on this platform as long as there's a certain kind of criteria here? Like because you guys do the fulfillment and, and, and maybe a little more marketing aspect to it, it, it is do you guys have some hand in, in the people that are on the platform? Like, how do you navigate some of these things? Yeah, I mean, a lot, a lot of what we do is honestly outreach. You know, mm -hmm. like, like I see you at conventions. It's because I'm there. I'm walking Artist Alley. I'm letting, you know, these creators know about what we do and how we could make putting out a book easier than ever. Um, it's cool because when I started doing all that, like, I had to give the whole pitch. And now I get a lot of, a lot of like, Oh, I know you guys, or, you know, now I'm, I'm starting to see the same people over and over again. So it's just like super friendly conversations. And, um, but it's a lot of outreach in that regard. Um, that being said, one of the reasons that we only have like a certain amount of projects on the platform at any given time is because we have a limited bandwidth, right? So we can't provide full services for the same amount of projects that you see on Kickstarter at any given time. So we have, you know, maybe like eight to 10 projects that are live at any time because we only have a certain amount of bandwidth. So that being said, um, we do choose the projects and it is based on the fact of like, do we think that this project will do a certain amount of, of money 
so that a it's worthwhile for us but more importantly we're taking a larger percentage of that campaign if it's you know a thousand dollar or twenty five hundred dollar campaign it doesn't make sense financially to give us you know a larger chunk of that campaign versus like hey oh you know we, we reach ten thousand dollars fifteen thousand dollars yes i can afford you know offloading like a lot of this work and and still make money on on the campaign so right. th there's there's that balance you know and that's one of the reasons that a lot of what we do is outreach and we, we get plenty of people that come to us as well and and we want to try to accommodate everybody unfortunately it's just a bandwidth issue so i we are not the arbiters of good taste um we are you know art is subjective i'll never we'll never say yes or no based on um like what we see like m meaning like if it's a pitch or if it's the artwork what we want is to know because even when a creator brings a project to zoop as we touched on before it's still incumbent on the creator to bring their crowd to crowdfunding we could ice the cake we could bring that extra 15 to 20 percent of backers but we don't bring the whole cake so one of the sort of like vetting processes of who we do work with is seeing like how much those creators are willing you know to go out there and promote what their social media looks like and i know it sounds kind of like crappy to you know to take it to that but that's you know if you have a creator that's never put anything out before that has no social media you know that like we wouldn't even be able to like book on youtube channels or you know on podcasts to like help promote it or get coverage in in you know news outlets that's going to be tough for everybody you know and and that's not saying that i know it's the catch-22 man you know like well then how can i get started with you know if i can't get help and you know it, it i know it's a tough thing and, and and we we don't ever like having to not work with anybody but uh, you know it, it's just what we're doing right now is still growing our platform to the point where one day yes we can open up the doors and work with everybody we're not at that point right now but hopefully um it no longer becomes an issue yeah yeah i mean it, it's understandable it's the nature of i think where all entertainment spaces are you know kind of now whether you're a musician or you're in film and stuff a lot of it is at one point a lot of the companies the publishers and stuff they would be the tastemakers like they would say sure. hey here's who you guys should listen to we're we're interscope records this is the new band, you know, right. but now it's like, okay, who's famous. And then now who do we need to help distribute? Like that's kind of where the internet, what the internet has done to entertainment in a way. And, and it's a kind of an interesting space we live in. So sure. yeah, it's understandable in that sense. Um, I want to kind of finish out with one other thing that I thought was interesting. Um, you had this company Republic that is kind of a, I don't know what you call them. It's like a, a in, in investing um, sort of platform. Yeah, it, they're in, they're in equity crowdfunding platform. Equity so. crowdfunding platform. Thank you for yes. that. Uh, Skybound is the one that really at least caught my sort of uh, sphere of uh, you know seeing it. Where Skybound did did something. They did a crowdfund for their company. Of course, people listening, maybe Sky Skybound's the, the company that was uh, created by Kirkham and has Walking Dead and kind of went to film and comics and stuff. Um, they did they did something in that space. You guys also have something in that space. Another company I've heard, I, I'm familiar with and I'm a fan of, it's called MySlabs. They're like a selling platform. Yeah. They, have, they have their campaign going on with it. Can you talk about what that is right now and what yeah. your guys' involvement in it is? Yeah, so it's kind of meta right because we're a crowdfunding platform utilizing another crowdfunding platform to crowdfund um but the reason for that is we're not legally set up uh for the same type of crowdfunding so what equity crowdfunding is and by the way uh our campaign is live right now at republic.com slash zoop but a real quick primer equity crowdfunding um I'll use the word democratizes investing in startups and companies. So you don't have to be an accredited investor. Um, some of you might be uh, familiar with fractional investing, right? If I have an amazing fantasy 15 and people are selling, you know, pieces of it for a thousand bucks a piece, um, you know, at like a 15, 
$15 million valuation. Sorry, I just had the number 15 in my head from Amazing Fantasy 15. But, um, you know, if they say that, you know, you buy in at $500,000 and and then that means your share is worth however much you paid for it is, you know, the percentage. And when they sell that comic, now you get a return on your investment, hopefully 3x, 4x, whatever, you know, whatever that's going to be. With Republic, this allows anybody to invest in startups. You don't have to invest tens of thousands. You could invest as little as $150. So if you're a comic fan, a collectibles fan, if you believe in crowdfunding, if you like what Zoop is doing and you want to support us, you now can. And for your contribution, that's essentially an investment in Zoop. So you're not getting a physical product. You are getting shares in Zoop. You get a piece of ownership in Zoop for as little as $150. So granted, the more you invest, the larger your piece of ownership is. Um, but yeah, this this makes investing in startups open to anybody. Um, and I shouldn't say that you don't get physical perks because we do have that. Those start at 250 bucks. We have some exclusive comics that the more you invest, the more rare the comics get at each investment tier. So I think this audience might, might appreciate that a little bit as well. You know, um, we have books. Um, with covers by Des Taylor, who we actually mentioned earlier, um, who's done a lot of pop stuff for DC, has his book Scarlet Couture. Um, but your regular covers, virgin cover, black and white cover, foil, metal covers. And so with each successive tier, you get all the comics before that. But the higher the tier, the fewer comics are going to be produced. So the more and more rare those become. Um, one other thing I should note, and this is a big thing because, you know, typically when people go to Zoop or Kickstarter, they see that it's an all or nothing campaign, right? Like if you don't hit your goal, you don't get the money. On the Republic campaign, it shows a, a listing of a maximum goal of $1.24 million. That's not our actual funding goal. That is just the, the maximum we are legally allowed to raise uh, by the SEC under regulation CF, which stands, you know, regulation crowdfunding. Um, any any amount that gets invested into Zoop is going to Zoop. We don't have to hit that $1.24 million number. So we're over $100,000 right now. We're very happy with that. It's only going to continue to grow. This is a longer campaign than a traditional, you know, like project-based, rewards-based crowdfunding campaign. Um, but yeah, I, we appreciate the support of the comics community. If you have questions, you could always ask questions uh, on the campaign page, republic.com slash Zoop. Um, Mickey, I hope I answered your question about yeah. like what it is and what you get. Do you think that the creative space in entertainment, Skybound, film, comic books, all you know, everything here is kind of going to this? I think entertainment is cyclical. Um, I, I, again, I come from the music industry and you, and you would see that in a, in a period of time, all these like indie labels popping up all over the place. You know, let's say you have like a hundred indie labels. Well, eventually the four or five major labels start swooping them all up so that they're all gone. And now we have those major conglomerates, right? And that's like the only place that you can get your music. But then eventually the market rebels and restarts again. And then you start seeing another wave of those independent labels coming out but the cycle repeats itself. So I think that we're just in a cycle right now. You know, think of like the image boom in the 90s. What's really been like the next sort of like creator owned like boom in the cycle? It maybe it is crowdfunding. And and again, we're just in that cycle. I mean, if you take a look at people like a Jimmy Palmiotti or a Brian Polito, or I give all the credit in the world to Charlie Stickney, like these guys are essentially spearheading, in my opinion, the way that like, you know, your McFarlane's and Jim Lee's did in the 90s, that they might not be a collective, you know, in that same way. But they're the grandfathers, they're like at the forefront of the movement um, that a lot of other people seem to be dipping their toes in. And then look, what, you know, what's going to happen, it probably all gets consolidated and starts all over again. I mean, that's, I think I think it's just cyclical. There's a lot of conversation in our uh, hobby about AI art. Do you have thoughts on that aspect of the hobby? Have you talked with any creators that are doing AI or exploring it? What's your general thoughts if you have any? I've honestly not had conversations with anyone like pitching, hey, this is an AI generated book or, or script or anything like that. Um, it, it's funny. Uh, 
I could see practical applications for AI that makes everybody's life easier, right? I get that. But it seems unfortunate that what AI seems mostly to be focused on is doing the stuff that's supposed to be fun and creative versus like helping you do your dishes or like, you know, fold your laundry. Like that, that would be, that would be to me, those are the better uses for AI of like helping me do the mundane things that I don't want to actually have to handle. If I could just press a button or, you know, type in some line somewhere and all of a sudden like my dishes are done, you know, that type of thing I wish was the more um, frequently used application for AI. That being said, I'm not a creator, um, but I think just objectively, objectively, the nature of AI is basically theft, <laughs> it, you know, mean, meaning, right, like in order for AI to work, it has to actually come through and generate billions of images, let's say, yeah. um, that it doesn't necessarily legally have the rights to obtain and like reuse. Um, I don't think you could really argue that as like a fact, you know, so that being said, I completely understand like we're artists, <sighs> man. Yeah. We, we, we could go on for a while about this, but it's like, you know, if, if someone was just like, um, paint me, you know, an Alex Ross painting and then I take credit for it. It's like, well, no, you didn't really do anything. You're not an artist. Like someone right. who prompts AI, in my opinion, is not an artist, someone who had to spend decades to hone their craft in order to create something out of nothing. Um, you know, that being said, like, if you if you use AI in order to create something in the image of somebody else's work, that's probably not very cool. But maybe on the flip side, if you use AI because you have a story that you want to tell and you, you know, like, look, I started a business because I can't write and I can't draw. Like I did what, you know, I needed to do. But if one day I had an idea for a story and and I used AI to help me visualize or bring that story to life in a more general sense, as opposed to stealing other people's styles. Right. I don't know. Maybe I could see that as, as something, but at the same time, it goes back to the first thing I said, like the, the actual usage of AI means like it, it is using other people's art from in order for me to do what I'm doing. There's gotta be some way to potentially regulate it. I mean, for me with AI, it's, it just feels kind of just feels like common sense practices. Like, you know, when you're, kind of lazily copying, right? Like you say, Alex Ross painting, and then you say, here's my painting. Or, you know, if it's like, hey, you use some things to kind of help you tell a story and it's a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here, and maybe that's okay. I mean, I don't know, it's 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 still pulling. Yeah, like if you're, if you're like, hey, I, I, I need an image of a fairy in, in a garden with dew on the leaves and, you know, sun shining from this angle, like, I feel like maybe if you're not specifying like certain people's type of artwork, then yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know where the line is. I, I'll be honest. Like I, I'm, I'm kind of just spitballing as we're talking about it right now. I don't know, but I could see where creators are rebelling against it like big time because I could see a publisher, you know, not having to hire a team of, of individuals to create a comic book and just have like one person doing prompts and then they could put out a slate of comic books. And then all of a sudden, like what happens to the whole industry? Like, so I could see that fear, you know, and, and it's not an illogical leap, <laughs> you know, to, to make that assumption. Yeah. So well, I, I understand the fears behind it for sure. Which is why all the more reason to, you know, from when you, when you get the chance to, to do your own projects, you know, even if it's something a little more bespoke with your own audience, you can go on Zoop and, uh, you know, realize your own dream with your own fans. So there you go. Well, there you go. thank you so much for, for hanging out with me today, having this conversation. Uh, maybe you can sort of let the people know um, where they could find you, anything you got kind of coming up, what you got going on, uh, you know, if they have more questions about uh, Zoop or uh, you personally. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, the, look, the first thing that we have live right now is that equity crowdfunding campaign on republic.com slash Zoop. Um, this is instead of us going to VCs, uh, you know, and trying to to get that 
that bag, as the kids say. This is going straight to the community in order to come support us. So any support is appreciated there. Uh, to check out the campaigns that we have live and that are coming soon on Zoop, we are at zoop.gg, not zoop.com. That's some Brazilian tax outfit, um, but zoop.gg. Uh, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at we are Zoop. And if you want to drop us an email, submit a project. Uh, we're hello at wearezoop.com. Uh, we have some great campaigns that are live right now. Like I said, the, the Vault Comics. Uh, we have something from Chris Weston, uh, who was the artist on The Filth with Grant Morrison. Uh, we have some upcoming projects from Patrick Horvath, from Adriana Mello, from Christian Ward, and uh, some other ones that I can't announce just yet. But check them out. Everybody appreciates the support. Uh, and you won't be disappointed with what you get in return. So, all right. Well, there you go. Thank you so much again, Jordan, for uh, ha hanging out with me here today. And um, you know, best of luck with all the projects you got going on. And we'll see you on the next episode.